Hello, welcome to Cupertino Insight. I'm Dorothy Cornelius, the city clerk of Cupertino, and your host for this program. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the winter offerings of the Parks and Recreation Department, the city's rental mediation committee, uh, the sale of surplus city property, and we'll also see a tape of Central Fire Protection District's new unit to fight hazardous chemicals spills. But first, I'd like you to meet Carol Skurich from our Parks and Recreation Department. Hi, Carol. Hi, Dorothy. I would like you to tell us a little, ba little bit about the city's winter schedule for Parks and Rec programs. Okay. Um, we've got lots of things in the works for 1985, um, some old things and some new things. One of the programs that are one of our old ones are our preschool program. And um, the new session begins in the end of January. And uh, we do have openings in the Monday, Wednesday afternoon program, which was from 12.30 to 3.30, and also our Friday enrichment program, which is 12.30 to 3.30. Um, we're taking registration right now, so if people are interested in those programs, they need to call the Parks and Recreation Department. Our uh, junior theater auditions are, are coming up at the end of January also. This will be the, our second production um, this school year. Uh, the production is uh, Once Upon a Mattress, which is the story of the princess and the right. pea. And we're very excited about it. Um, children that are 8 to 18 years old are encouraged to come to auditions. They'll be Monday and Tuesday, January 28th and 29th. Um, we encourage any children that are all interested um, in theater to come down and try out. Not only um, they might get involved in being uh, acting or actors or actresses right in the play, but there's lots of things, work to do backstage, um, getting involved in costuming, a variety of things that, which really give you an overall picture of what it's like to, mm -hmm. to be involved in a production. This is a musical, isn't it? A musical, most definitely. Yeah. Lots of singing, lots of dancing, and we're real excited about it. Um, we are also, again, offering lots and lots of specialist classes um, for adults and for youth. And in the area of adults, we've got um, our always popular exercise classes. Um, yeah. They're one of our most popular um, programs for adults. Especially after the holidays. Right? Definitely. Yeah. You know, really, winter is yeah. the most popular time for our uh, exercise classes. We've got aerobics classes, slim trim, a wide variety of, of things in that exercise area. We also have lots of dance classes, ballroom dance, tap dance. Um, jazz dance, a variety of those. And then what we are, are termed real specialty type items, which are callig calligraphy, Victorian lampshades, uh, chocolate desserts, our CPR classes that are real popular, um, and uh, lots and lots more. Uh, in the youth area, we have our gymnastics classes that are always very, very popular, and baton, and dance classes as well, and then some new classes called Busy Bodies, which is an aerobics class for children. Oh, that's cute. We're real yeah. excited about that and hope people will get their kids involved in that. And um, we've got speed breeding um, and uh, lots and lots of things for kids to get involved in in 1985. I know there's a wide variety. And they are listed in this month's Cupertino scene. Everything, all yeah. times, dates, fees, etc., are all in your Cupertino scene. We've got ski trips that um, are promoted by our teen um, leaders out at the schools as well as the Cupertino scene. Lots of trips for junior and senior high um, children. Uh, they just need to call the recreation department. We'll be happy to send them a Cupertino scene or a, our ski brochure, which lists everything. Um, also, um, this year we have some community garden plots that are available. Uh, in past years we've had such a long, long waiting list, and our waiting list isn't quite so long this year. And uh, garden plots are for Cupertino residents only, and they're located out at McClellan Ranch Park. We have approximately 66 garden plots, and um, they're uh, rental on a yearly basis. It's fantastic land to garden in. It's a very, very rich, rich soil. And um, most of the gardeners are very successful out at, um, out at the ranch. It takes a little hard work, um, but fees are very, very minimal. And, um, and we encourage people to give us a call and get on our waiting list or um, get involved in, in seeing what it would be like to have a plot down at the ranch. I would think that'd be very popular because we're also nutrition conscious these days. And We've got people that have gardened down there for years and years. and, and been very, very successful, and we are a little bit surprised. I think that um, in the past years we haven't done a lot of publicity on the program because it's been so popular, mm -hmm. and I think that maybe um, some of the people just are not aware of it, and once they find out, I think that uh, we'll get lots of people on the involved again and on our waiting list again. I know you said registration has started. Um, 
Is it for, re I believe it's just for residents at this time. How we start out registration, Dorothy, is for residents right at the beginning, and that mm -hmm. started January 4th with resident mail-in only. We always start out with mail-in registration. On January 11th, we start non-resident mail-in, and then starting on, I believe, the 16th, we start with resident and non-resident walk-in where they may come into the office. Now we take mail-in registration throughout the whole registration period. Mm -hmm. If people, if it's not convenient for people to ever come in our office, then it's not a problem at all for them just to mail in their registration form. We will accept it up until the second class meeting. All right. Now, I do recall reading in the scene that if someone drops their registration off either at City Hall or at McClellan Ranch Park where your offices are, that registration is held two days before processing. I would like to ask why that is. Well, it, when you first read it, it d seems that it doesn't quite make sense, but um, why we do that, Dorothy, is to try to make it as fair for people as possible. With so many people's working schedules, um, uh, people working in the evenings, different times, um, when we set up our registration, um, I think probably about six years ago, we decided that we would, to make it fair for everyone, we would start out with mail-in registration only. This way it makes it fair for everybody. Hopefully everybody receives their scene at the same time or within a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And after that, that's when we start accepting mail-in registration. Um, for example, if, if you didn't work and, um, and I worked I, and I could not get down to the office to drop out my registration form, I would have to mail it in. And, um, but you didn't work and you could bring it into the office, it would make it unfair for me who would have to wait two days. Right. And why we picked the two days is that we did a little survey a couple years ago and mailed different letters from various parts of the city and it looked, and the average and very, very close um, for almost all of them, did, it took two days um, from the time you mailed the letter until the, it came through postmarked in two days. Well, that's very fair. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for being here today. Thank you very okay. much. For those of you who are interested in taking a class from our Parks and Recreation Department, you may either call 253-2060 and talk to Carol or one of her associates, or check your Cupertino scene this month. Now, if you see some kind of a green line machine running around town, that is Central Fire Protection District's new unit to fight hazardous materials spills. We recently had the opportunity to take a look at it. Okay, this program is uh, very beneficial to the department and to the citizens we serve. Uh, as you know, there's been a great increase in the use of chemicals in our society, and along with that, there's been a great in increase in uh, spills of such chemicals. Hazmat 1, Central Fire District's hazardous materials response vehicle, has recently been placed in service. The $85,000 unit is one of 11 purchased through the state of California's Superfund in an effort to better respond to the Valley's chemical threat. Hazmat 1 is housed at the district's Quito Road Station and can be called to use in any Santa Clara County chemical incident. Department policy is to respond to any spills um, on the road or within uh, uh, occupancies within the uh, county and, or the district, and we will not. We are not a first responder. Uh, usually, an engine will respond first, and it's up to the incident commander, which is the first in captain, to call for this unit if it's needed. And then, what would you do once you got there? Well. We'd size up the situation. The first thing we want to do is determine what we have. And uh, when we find out what we have, we got a reference library within the rig. And we have uh, various agencies which we can call to determine information which we need to make a, uh, make the, take the right action to alleviate the problem. We are basically in the containment uh, mode. Uh, cleanup will usually be taken care of by a private company such as IT, uh, Chemical Waste Management. With this equipment, we're only limited by our imagination. Much of the equipment found on the Hazmat One looks very similar to household and hardware products we all have at home, yet there is some very specialized equipment on board. Some of the tools in here are highly specialized tools. They're made of uh, brass so they won't spark. So we can use these around flammable vapors without worrying about uh, creating a spark and causing an explosion. Uh, 
tools like this are really expensive, so it's, it was really nice to get this stuff from the state. It saved the department a lot of money. We have a weather station on the rig, and what it's used for is to give us information such as wind speed and wind direction. This is very important information when dealing with an uh, incident, as we want to approach the incident from upwind, and also it's important when we are determining uh, radiuses for evacuation. In addition, Hazmat 1 carries two types of protective clothing for firefighters to wear, depending upon the seriousness of the incident. We've got two examples here. And what these are used for is um, incidents involving highly toxic vapors or gases. And we're talking about the type of gases and vapors that uh, pose a health hazard through skin absorption or just contact with the skin. These suits are very difficult to work in and take approximately five to 10 minutes just to put them on. When, when we're working in the suits, we have a limited, limited uh, air. It, we probably have about 20 minutes worth of air, so uh, what we have to do, we have to send one mission in there just to kind of go in and see what we have, and then send another crew in to maybe take care of the problem or start to take care of the problem. It might take three or four entries in these suits to take care of the uh, problem that we have. Uh, another problem with these suits is communication. It's very hard to talk between these firefighters because they can't hear. They've got a Scott air mask on and a face shield, and there's usually a lot of noise at the incident, so it's really hard to communicate. Um, we'll be using these are we'll be using these only in the uh, incidents where we need the highest degree of protection. I think we're about as prepared as we can be at this time. That's not to say that uh, equipment and the ongoing education won't continue to uh, be revised and improved uh, as, as industries come into the area and as we become more aware of what's in the area. Uh, the equipment will be changing, I'm sure, as well as the ongoing education. We went through extensive training, approximately 180 hours of training, and it's, uh, for a lot of us, uh, that didn't have a chemi chemistry background, it was pretty tough, you know. It went through about 40 hours of uh, chemistry, and then uh, we went through 80 hours of a class that was given by the National Fire Academy, which was basically hands-on um, how, how to uh, use the equipment that we were issued with this rig, um, how to clean up spills, and how to contain, contain spills. Uh, it was very extensive training. I feel that our department is as well prepared as any department in the state right now for hazardous materials. It's nice to know the machine is there with a fully trained crew ready for action, but let's hope we never have to use it. With me now to talk about the city's rental mediation committee are Sharon Blaine and Terry Brown. Terry. Could you please give us a little bit of background about how and why this committee was formed? Sure. Uh, some several months ago, the Cupertino City Council appointed a rental housing committee of some 13 members whose job it was to come up with some recommendations to the council relative to improving the rental housing situation in the city. One of the recommendations that we came up with after several months of work was that a mediation program be set up. and that uh, that program be designed by a subsequent committee, which would be smaller and uh, somewhat easier to work with to work out details. And that's how we came about. All right. And exactly what kind of issues are you addressing and what's your purpose? Okay, what we're looking at are um, the actual working out or setting up of the program for mediation and uh, how it would be set up, who would be doing mediation, what would they be doing, and uh, working through all of that type of information. I see. Um, I assume these people are going to be trained. You're not just oh, going to pick yes. people <laughs> off the street and say, here, we have a problem we, between a renter and a landlord, uh, solve it. Yes. Well, what we first had to do was decide what would be subject to mediation. And we had to decide who would take care of these things. And there are various services which um, provide these, or companies that provide these services to cities. 
and the committee has decided that what would be done would be the uh, city would contract with one of these services. I see. The um, mediators who would be used to mediate the disputes would be volunteers, but they would be trained by the mediation service that was contracted with. What so. kind of things are you looking for from a volunteer? Um, I'd assume that you're going to be trying very hard to find someone who would be very impartial. Um, the, the only parameters that we established really were that they either be a resident of Cupertino or have some demonstrated interest in the community, such as being a businessman here or perhaps an employee of a local firm. Uh, aside from that, anyone who's willing to spend the time and take the training and would obviously have some kind of interest in the process right. would, would be welcome to apply. It would take some kind of commitment, certainly. <laughs> yeah, because they are unpaid. This is <laughs> it's volunteer. This is free volunteer time. Yeah. Right. Have you decided what kinds of things a mediator would hear and try to settle? Well, I think first uh, we had to decide what would we want from a mediation service because not all things are going to need mediation, and what we would prefer, what we will want from this service, will be uh, information, um, people who could give information to tenants and landlords or anyone else who has a concern. Mm -hmm. And they will call the city or there will be a number, I'm, we're not sure how that would work, um, and say what their problem is and perhaps all they need is information. But the service could provide that information. Uh, maybe they need to know what their legal rights are before um, you really get into the, having to go through mediation you might not need to, you might be able to solve the problems before then. Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. yes, we're really aiming for that. Well, one of the things we discovered in the discussions with the original committee was that uh, communication or lack of communication is usually the source of the problem and even amongst the committee members, we were from all walks of life, the first 13 members, and uh, the more we talked, the more we decided that we actually were in agreement, so we kept talking until we were in unanimous agreement. That's terrific. And I think the same thing probably applies to a lot of rental disputes and conflicts that if they can be talked out, the parties can be brought together or information can be given back and forth, uh, we're hopeful and, and really sure that most of the problems can be worked out that way. Is there some kind of procedure set up yet for a resident or a landlord who has some kind of problem? Uh, not really at this point. I think they will that's one of the things that the mediation service that's contracted with will be setting up. That's part of the, uh, their job description, will be to set up a procedure and uh, set up an information in, uh, center or someplace people can get information, as well as setting up the whole mediation uh, procedures pr process, as well also, and we forgot, there needs to be a reporting process also so that um, they can be, their activities can be reviewed as well as the, um, the city council mm -hmm. needs to know how well the program is working. Suppose the person receives information and unfortunately the issue is still not resolved. Then they go through some kind of mediation process and unfortunately there is still not a meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. um, has any, have you looked at all beyond that point? Well, the mediation process that we're designing, uh, that we'll recommend, uh, is the total, sum total of the process. There is a, a second tier mediation. There will be a provision for one, at least we'll recommend one, which will come about if the parties in the first place were, would, would refuse to attend a meeting or refuse to participate in mediation, and as a result of that refusal, uh, fail to reach some agreement. When do you expect this to go before the city council? Hmm. We what? have, let's see, we're going to finalize our recommendations. Uh, one more meeting, I hope. One more meeting, hopefully, next week, yeah. I guess. Okay, yeah. and then it should be very soon yes. before yeah. council. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Within a few weeks. Within a few weeks, uh -huh. right. All right. Thank you. Sharon and Terry, I want to thank you both very much for taking time out of your hectic schedules to come here today and you both and the rest of your committee have done a really fantastic job because I know that has not been a very uh, easy issue to work with in the city of Cupertino or anywhere else for that matter. Well, we thank you.
Yeah, you're welcome. The city of Cupertino has some property for sale. And here to talk with me about it is Bert Viscovich, the city's director of public works. Bert, why is this property for sale and where is it located? Okay. Uh, they are surplus properties that the city no longer has any need for public use. Uh, their residential lots are located at, off of Stelling Road, Shadow Hill by Three Oaks Park. And then the other property is in Monta Vista on a corner of Pasadena and Orange. I believe that's the old uh, Cupertino oh. util water utility building. And uh, KKUP occupied that's that for right. a few months. Yeah, I remember that. A few years, that. really. A few years, yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, starting with the th lots located near the Three Oaks Park, could you tell us uh, the approximate size of the lots? How many are for sale? That's okay, there are seven of them, and they're all uh, minimum 6,000 square foot lots, which is a zoning in that area. Uh, they are located adjacent to the park, as I mentioned earlier. All the improvements are in, all the utilities are in, so anyone that purchases these lots are able to obtain a building permit and actually start construction. Uh, they are, uh, uh, there's about two of them, I think they're larger than 6,000 square feet, but they're minimum 6,000. Now what's the land use in that area? It's residential and single family uh, homes and adjacent to these lots are, are the same type. They're all detached. Now it's my understanding that there is a restriction in that area the, to single story homes. The city imposed a single story restriction, that's correct, okay. because the residents in that area wish that the homes stay with the same type and that the, some of the views of the hills are remain as you can see on the, on the slides. I see, so regardless, once once the lots are purchased, even if they're sold again, that single story restriction stays with the lot. That's correct. All right. Now, could you tell us about a little bit about the procedure for the sale? I understand it will be a bidding procedure, and yes. there is a minimum bid that is acceptable. Yeah. It's an interesting procedure, and in, in uh, there will be a minimum of $80,000 for the first lot that's uh, bid on, and uh, there won't be a bid on a particular lot, but it'll just be the first bid. The highest bidder, both through the oral bid and the written bid, and by the way, it starts off with a written bid first, and if there is a oral bid subsequent to that, that's 5,000 or greater, then we go into an oral bid. The highest bidder then will, will get a uh, choice of their lot and mm -hmm. be able then to, uh, once we get established that price for that first lot, the second lot that goes out on the auction will then have the minimum bid being the, the previous sale. So what happens that it really encourages people to purchase that first lot for two reasons. One, it kind of establishes or guarantees that the, the, it will be the lowest price. Right. And number two, it, it gives them the choice of the lot that they wish. That's right, they would get the They would get their, their choice. choice, that's right. Right, okay. Now where is the bidding going to be? Bidding will be at the City Hall and it will be at the same time as the council meeting is taking place at 7.30 in our conference room. And so after each bid, we will have to get approval by the City Council during their meeting before we proceed to the next lot. Right. That's the February 19th February 19th meeting, meeting. that's right. correct. Right. Now tell me a little bit about the building on Pasadena Avenue. The actual the building itself probably won't be used after the lot is sold. I think the main uh, highest and best use of that property will be to uh, combine it with other properties in the area and actually develop it to the Monta Vista plan of an office type complex right, or so commercial. So that's zoned, it can be... It, it is a planned unit development uh, for office intent with commercial also and that is part of the, like I mentioned, the Monta Vista plan. And, I don't think that lot singly will be able to develop. It will probably be combined with other lots in that area. I see. What's the minimum bid on that lot? That one's $95,000. And all these, by the way, are cash. And so it would uh, uh, behoove the individuals that want to bid to get their financing and get some of the uh, paperwork out of the way before they do come out to bid. And at the time of the bid, the actual uh, there will be a bid bond of $5,000 for each purchase and 10000 for any bid bonds for an oral uh, bid. So uh, 
those bonds will have to be submitted prior to the right. bidding. Now, I did read the resolutions of intent, and unless I'm wrong, it says a cashier's or certified check in those amounts. Right. All right. right. But would a bid bonds be acceptable also? Uh, that, that, that we'd have to check in the okay. bidding document. I think it's right. a $5,000 amount in whatever form right. it is that, uh, that's, that's required in that bid document is what they'll have to deposit. All right. Now, they also submit the sealed written bids, and then it's open to oral bidding after that. That's right. That. And it'll rec it, there'll be a $5,000. Uh, 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 it'll require a minimum of 5000 higher bid than the uh, uh, sealed bid in order to go to the oral bid. All right. Thank you very much for being here today, Bert. I appreciate it. If any of you are interested in getting more information about these lots and the process to purchase one, please call the dire Director of Public Works, Bert, at City Hall, 252-4505. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about a couple of openings that we have on some advisory commissions at the City of Cupertino. We currently have one opening on our Cable TV Advisory Committee for a term which will end in September of 1987. This particular committee more or less um, oversees the local programming on Channel 3 and also makes recommendations to Council on other cable matters. We have two openings on an ad hoc committee that's looking into the possibility of a recycling program for the city of Cupertino. Anyone interested in an application for these positions should contact me at City Hall, 252-4505. Applications will be accepted until January 11th, and Council will interview all applicants and make appointments on January 21st. Thanks a lot for watching Insight tonight, and we'll see you in two weeks. Good night.